On the eve of its 75th birthday, this spring of 2023, Israel stands at the verge of a potentially fateful decision that impacts its very identity. The new government is pressing for a judicial restructuring package that would dramatically alter the balance of power in the Israeli government. Members of the governing coalition have justified the legislative package as a response to an overpowering and unelected judiciary that undermines the decision of the elected Knesset, in their words, and therefore the majority of the Israeli public. Opponents have labeled the package as a radical judicial overhaul. This debate carries significant implications for Israel's future as a democracy and its international standing. The political temperature in Israel is rising as 100,000 Israelis are coming to the streets each Saturday night in Tel Aviv and in over a dozen cities across the country to protest the move. Proponents say they will not be deterred. They are moving forward with the bill in the Knesset. Can a compromise be brokered by Israel's President Herzog? Or is a clash between proponents and opponents inevitable? Hello, and welcome to Decision Points. I'm David Murkowski, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I'm happy to go on this journey with you. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Finance Minister Bitsalel Smotrich have argued that these judicial reforms, quote unquote, will bring Israel closer to the systems of the United States and other Western parliamentary democracies. However, Israel's system is unique from these other democracies. First and foremost, Israel does not have a constitution like the United States with its protections, including having three quarters of all U.S. states approve any proposed amendment. Israel has tried to write a constitution, but is doing so in chapters amid differences of reaching a consensus over religion and state. The Knesset has gradually enacted legislation called Basic Laws, which are intended to be the foundation for a future constitution. Moreover, the government largely operates on common law, derived from the British and Ottoman periods. Second, Israel does not have the same checks and balances present in the American model. Israel's executive is part of the legislative branch, the Knesset, which in itself is unicameral. There are no term limits on cabinet ministers, the prime minister is in his sixth term, and there is no federal system in which regional powers check the national government. While Israel's Supreme Court is similar to its U.S. counterpart in certain respects, as they are both the highest courts in the land and the final court of appeals for Israel's general law court system, it operates in a highly distinct manner. Unlike its U.S. counterpart, the Supreme Court initiates about 10,000 proceedings a year, with many cases heard before a panel ranging from a single justice to 15 justices. It is in the cases of special importance that the Supreme Court sits in expanded panels. Given the absence of a constitution and the low bar for petitions, the Israeli Supreme Court makes a high number of delicate decisions on a regular basis. Under the American system, the U.S. Supreme Court has almost from the beginning of our country reserved the right to strike down legislation that it views as unconstitutional. This is called judicial review. Israel has come to this point about 30 years ago under the leadership of its famed Chief Justice, Aaron Barak. It was part of a shift that provided Israel with its own Bill of Rights to protect individuals. Taken together, it was called by Barak to be a, quote, constitutional revolution, end quote, which kept the focus on protecting minorities with limited power and protecting Israeli democracy against interest groups. In practice, however, the Israeli Supreme Court used its power sparingly. Only 22 laws have been struck down in almost 30 years. Yet the Likud coalition members today say it's not just those 22 cases, but the court rules routinely on petitions and together it gives the court outsized influence. And it also means that Israeli parliamentarians are deterred from enacting other laws, fearing that they will be struck down. In previous governments, Justice Ministers Ayelet Shaked and Gideon Saar have suggested reforms to the system, 
but neither have proposed reforms that are so wide-sweeping as the package put forward by current Justice Minister Yariv Levine, who's made it his life's mission to curtail the powers of the Israeli Supreme Court. Levine's four-part package includes a simple majority parliamentary override clause on all judicial decisions, meaning any coalition government of 61 out of 120 parliamentarians can overturn an Israeli Supreme Court ruling. The transformation of ministerial legal advisors into political appointees. The cancellation of what is known in Israel as the standard of extreme unreasonableness and the changes to the composition of the Judicial Selection Committee from one that balances Knesset representatives, Supreme Court justices, and members of the Bar Association into one that is primarily comprised of Knesset and even coalition representatives. In a public speech, Chief Justice Esther Chayut charged the four moves in the Levine package would have dire implications for Israeli democracy and would politicize the court beyond recognition. Critics note the backdrop for this are the ongoing legal troubles for Prime Minister Netanyahu, who's still in the middle of a corruption trial. Both Israeli President Isaac Bougie Herzog and Chief Justice Chayut have urged the effort to press for the restructuring of the court be halted until efforts for a broad-based societal compromise be attempted. So far, Netanyahu and Levin have disagreed to halt the move to enact the package in the Knesset, although rumors remain they will be open to compromise after the first of three readings of the proposed bill to be passed by the Knesset. So is a compromise possible? Is it likely? And what does all this mean for the future of Israeli democracy? With me today are two prominent experts who know the ins and outs of Israel's judiciary and its history. The first is Professor Yedidia Stern, the president and CEO of the Jewish People Policy Institute, JPPI, a full professor and former dean of the law faculty of bar Ilan University, and a former senior fellow of the Israel Democracy Institute, and someone who has chaired a variety of government committees. The second is Justice el Rubinstein, the recently retired Deputy Chief Justice of Israel's Supreme Court, who has also served as Israel's Attorney General and has also served a critical role in shaping Israel's peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan. We will first talk to Yedidia and then to Eliakim. First, I want to welcome Professor Yedidia Stern. Yedidia, welcome to Decision Points. It's my pleasure, David. So we're going to go into the, all the details about Israeli Justice Minister Yariv Levin's policy suggestions. But first, I would like your overall reaction. How do you see the package? What does it mean for democracy? There's criticism. And I want to ask you if you feel it's fair or unfair when the critics say, if you enact this package, it puts Israel on the trajectory to Hungary and Poland. You've seen a lot of Israelis come out and demonstrate. The reports say 100,000 on every Saturday night, including uh, the first week where it was rain, pouring rain of 80,000. What's your overall reaction? You know, David, every democracy, I believe, struggles with the proper balance between the different branches of the government, government, judiciary, parliament. The current situation in Israel is uh, quite shaky before the reform because the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, and the government are basically formed as one organ in reality. So you don't have checks and balances between the parliament and the government. Now, the main issue with the reform is that it might really weaken the judiciary in Israel. And if this will happen, the government will stay in power without any serious way to stop it from exercising its powers the way a specific government is interested in. And if this happens, democracy is still there in Israel because we go to, uh, to the polls every four years, but it will be quite a shallow kind of democracy because there is a threat that if you are a minority or individual and the majority in the government and in the Knesset 
as I said earlier, they are one in Israel. If they will decide to harm you, now you can go to the court. But if the court will be very weak, you have no rescue. So that's why Israelis are really coming out of their homes in the midst of the winter, hundreds of thousands, and uh, demonstrating. So you're saying they do have something to be worried about if the judiciary loses the independence that's been the hallmark of Israel for these 75 years of its existence, if it becomes more subordinate in, in any way to the parliament and to the government? Because unlike America, the parliament and the government are the same in, in many ways. Yeah, and I, I want to stress that the weakening of the judiciary, according to this reform, takes two tracks. One is limiting the authority of the judiciary, and the other track is politicizing it, making the future court in Israel nominated by politicians. I know that the American audience is used to it, but for Israel it's totally different. So putting the two together, politicizing the judiciary and limiting its powers will weaken it in such a way that every minority in Israel should be scared of what might happen. And you have to realize Israel, beside of, the, of being a Jewish democratic state, and beside of being state of all its citizens, is also state of all its minorities. Because every Israeli is part of a minority. We do not have a hegemony in Israel. Society is divided into sectors with different belief systems, and different interest, and this is the beauty of Israel. We are very diversified, but this might be not functioning very well, this diversification, if the majority takes it all and there is no boundaries to its power. So that's why, if I could, maybe just go through what I, it looks like to me, and you're the expert on this, four of the changes that I understand from Levine, and if we can just go through them quickly for our listening audience. So first is the override clause. And what is the Netanyahu trying to accomplish by this change? And we heard that just now today that Yariv Levin said, well, 61 is not, doesn't have to be 61. But what it looks like is that if you have a coalition of 61, and just for our audience, 61 is the minimum you need for a government in a 120-member Knesset, a bare majority, that any coalition essentially can reverse a Supreme Court decision. That's the way it looks by enabling this override. So I'm just, I would like your reaction. Yeah, today, David, in Israel, whenever you have a dilemma, a dispute, and the Knesset decides, passes a law, you can go to the court and the court will have the last word. The court can say, well, I judicial review, you American, you use it always and you know it. By judicial review, we decide that this specific piece of legislation is not, it's unconstitutional and therefore not legitimate and therefore there is no validity to it anymore. What the override is trying to do is to say that the last word will be kept by the Knesset and the last word can be on everything. If they decide, and the Knesset decides by law, to harm the ultra-Orthodox, to harm Israeli Arabs, to harm poor people, to harm the workers, or to harm the rich people in Israel. Now we can go to the court and the court can protect us. In the future, if the override clause will be the law of the state, the classic may, may say to the court, well, we heard you, thank you very much. We insist on, passing, on going on with a piece of legislation. Now you have to realize that using the override in Israel might be a daily thing, knowing the cultural, the political culture in Israel, the court, and the Knesset are now in a struggle of power. And I think, I suspect, that the Knesset might be using it in a frequent way. And beside of the specific issue which, that we are going to deal with in the future, it's also the status of the court. It becomes, you know, another kind of thing, not binding, 
and I think the respect to the court might be go down the drain. Though I believe that maybe on some issues we should let the Knesset to have the last word. I think it's not one rule fits all, it depends on the issue. If you're talking about human rights and minorities, you cannot trust the Knesset. The Knesset is a threat. But if you talk about the nature of the state of Israel, the public sphere, what it should look like, then I think that's why we have politics. That's why we go to the poll. Yes, the Knesset should have the last word. So if you had to say what would be reasonable on this issue, some would say, well, look, if you had an override clause of 70 or 75, I don't know, but is there a number that you would feel on certain issues the number should be higher, on certain issues the number should be lower, or do you think the whole principle is, is wrong? No, first of all, I'm saying before we go into numbers, the idea of who makes the last decision should be uh, divided or applied on different issues differently. That's number one. Now, whenever the issue is human rights, there is no majority that's big enough to protect minorities. Why do you think that the 80 Knesset member can harm the minorities? So I don't think the override is relevant on these issues. On the other issue in Israel, identity of the public sphere, over there I think we can allow the override to apply. And I think we need to have six, at least six Knesset members, not from the coalition, but from the opposition, to support the override, then it will be okay on these specific issues. The character of the state. I can give you an example to make it more clear. Let's say, let's say we're talking about uh, the status of the reforms in Israel, issues of religion and state. Right now, Israeli court made a decision, and this is a law of the state today, that we recognize conversion done by reformed Batei Din, from a, a religious court, okay? If we'll have an override clause, the Knesset, the current coalition, will say we are not going to recognize any more reforms, conversions in Israel. So the reform movement, or I, Edidia, will go to the court and say, how can you do that? The court will say, well, this is unconstitutional, but the Knesset will be able to override the court and say to the reform movement in Israel, we do not recognize your conversions anymore. This might be the case. Now, do we think that the last word on this issue is mainly an issue of human rights? or mainly an issue of identity in Israel? This is an open question. Or think about the draft of the ultra-Orthodox to the IDF. Right now, the court, time after time again, said to the Knesset, well, the way you enact on these issues is unconstitutional, it's not equal enough, go back and find another way to solve the problem. The Knesset is not doing it for 50 years. Once you have an override, the Knesset will decide whatever they will decide, and this will be the last station on this journey, so to speak. So to me, as long as a dominant issue is human rights, David, no majority can overrule the decision of the court who is a last resort for minorities. It's very important to understand. But if you talk about something else, about something that, you know, the, the, the face of Shabbat, of Saturday in Israel, I think the Knesset should, should have the last word on this issue. Do you put the draft as a, an equal protection clause, uh, you know, e equal rights? Is that an issue of rights of a minority? And, and in which bucket would that be? I personally, I think this should be decided by the Knesset because I think the majority in the Knesset can decide what they want on this issue. The majority of the Knesset can say to the Haredim, to the ultra orthodox guys, you have to serve like everybody else. If the majority is not willing to do that, I don't think that the court should protect the majority against the minority who are the ultra orthodox. So I would leave it to the Knesset. So on this, the issue of who selects the judges, and we spoke about a little before, and you alluded that the American model is a bit different. But the American model also, the U.S. has a constitution. We in the U.S. have two houses of Congress, not one. We have term limits. 
president uh, can only be two terms. This prime minister is on his sixth term and there's no limit. And on amendments in America, you need three quarters of the states for one amendment. And Israel, though it has a basic law, it doesn't have like a constitution in stages on a per issue basis. It doesn't have anything like that. So I find it interesting uh, if you could relate to the issue of the judicial selection question, how people are invoking the American model. Well, America does it, so that should be good enough for us But in Israel, but, in, but America's got a lot of other protections that Israel doesn't have. So I'm, I just want to know if you could broaden that out. Yeah, the whole comparison is not relevant. How can you compare zebras and elephants? You cannot compare them, different animals. So it's rhetoric only. Don't take it seriously. And I, and you alluded to it, and I agree. I mean, you can add to it that in American system, you do not have the override, and Levine is willing to do the override. So how can you compare the two? No way to compare. But let's talk about the essence of it. The system right now in Israel of selecting judges, we have a committee of nine, three of which are Supreme Court judges. The justice minister is the head of the committee. Another minister, meaning member of the coalition, is also on the committee. So you have two politicians for the coalition. Another Knesset member from the coalition is also on the committee. So you have already three people from the coalition. Then another Knesset member from the opposition. Okay. And the other two are representative of uh, the Bar Association in Israel. So it's basically a composition between three branches, the judges, politicians divided three from the coalition, one from the opposition, and professionals from the Bar Association. And right now in Israel, in order to select for the Supreme Court a judge, you need a majority of seven out of the nine, meaning that right now, each one of the, um, the politicians and the judges they have a veto power, but they cannot decide the way they want, disregarding the others on the committee. So you the current need to kind of compromise, and I like it very much. It works well. So you give me what I want, I give you what you want. That's how we behave in life. What the reform is trying to do is to give the sole power to the politicians for the coalition only to make the decision who will be the judges. So soon enough, we'll have a politicized court. First of all, the judges in the district courts, which is a lower court in Israel, if they want to advance in their career to the Supreme Court, they will calculate what we should do right now in order to be there, which is obviously very bad. I believe that politicization of the court system in Israel is the worst part of the reform. It interferes with the integrity of the system. It's not only changing the powers, it's changing it from within. But it is also one-sided. Once you give them the power, it's irreversible. And most likely another government will not be willing to change it again. That is a thing I would never give up. Wow. This whole idea of the standard of extreme unreasonableness, this is something for an American audience that has come up as one of the changes that Levin wants to cancel and yet this is part of a Supreme Court decisions. Could you just explain the standard and why it's important and why is it? it's not important just to introduce an American audience to this? The courts exercise judicial review of the reasonableness of executive action through a series of grounds. For example, exceeding authority, improper procedure, discrimination, and others. However, sometimes the court is interested in reviewing the executives outside of this specific criteria. And for this purpose, the court created the criteria of reasonless. The court is trying to see if the act of the government, the executive, is reasonable, yes or no. You know, David, last week we had a case in Israel when in a small village with some 800 families, 200 of which are religious and 600 are not. And there is no mikveh, which is a ritual death for religious purposes. There was no mikveh built in this uh, village. 
so the 200 Orthodox families asked the municipality to build it for them. And the majority says, no, we're not going to spend taxpayer money for your purposes. So they went to the court, the religious people went to the court and asked the court to come for the rescue. And the court says it's not reasonable not to allow them to have what every other village has, which is a mikveh. So the court used this open-ended criteria of being reasonable in exercise authority and decided that the mikveh should be built. So that's one example of how you can use it in order to protect minority against the exercise of the discretion of the executive, which is an improper kind of discretion. To say it's not unacceptable, so you apply the reasonableness kind of criteria. However, the problem is that people say, and sometimes I, I agree with this criticism, why do you think you, the court, that your discretion is better than the discretion of the government? Why do you apply your discretion in order to overrule the discretion of those with authority? They are selected, you are not selected. They are re-elected every four years, you are not. And also reasonable is very ambiguous, ambiguous term. What's reasonable? Nobody can tell you what's reasonable. So these are the issues. Again, I think over here we can have a change. I'm not against any change. I'm for some changes, but you have to pick your changes smartly. So in this specific issue, for example, just to give you an idea of what might be a solution, I would say don't use reasonableness as criteria when the government is making decision as a government or where a minister is making a decision and the government approves it. But still use this criteria in order to review decisions of the executives when you talk about the rest of the executive in Israel, which is the vast majority obviously of issues. So here's the balance I would go for. Very interesting. Uh, I, I mean, I think the point you're also making is there are cases where you do think reform is needed. It's not that the status quo is, is so perfect, but you want to make the changes carefully and so that they have broad support and as Secretary of State Blinken say, so it'll endure. Okay, so let me just zoom out for a minute and just say, why is this all happening now? It seems that each coalition partner has their own concerns on the court. In the case of the prime minister, he feels the law enforcement system has been unfair to him because they played hardball with state's witnesses, and he clearly wants to extricate himself from his trial. For the ultra-Orthodox, they've been upset, like you've been saying, about not allowing the wholesale exemption of yeshiva students from the military. The settlers, they have not liked rulings about the West Bank and the use of West Bank land. It seems that everybody's got their own separate grievance and yet it's crystallizing now because of each one of the parts wants to change and wants to weaken the court. I mean, is that fair? I'm just trying to understand for an American audience, why now? Why is this all coming to the fore right now? Two major explanations. One is not specific to now and, and to here, to Israel, and the other is very specific. The first one is we know in postmodern society, authority doesn't count. You go to a doctor, you hear what he or she tell you, and then you go to, to the main doctor, Google. The same with private authority, the same with rabbis, the same obviously with politicians, and the same with courts. You know, when I used to be a student in the law school a few years ago, I looked at the, at the judgment of the Supreme Court as, uh, you know, as a religious person looks into the, into the Bible. This is true, now I have to understand it. Nowadays, obviously, I teach my students, this is what the court thought. Now, let's discuss it. It's their view. What is your view? So there's a basic change in our culture, number one. But the most specific answer to your question, David, is the following. Israeli politics is not providing answers to the major dilemmas of Israeli life. Time after time, again, we know that the Knesset is not there for us to give us a solution, a real solution. And time after time, people going to the court, it's the last generation, it's already 25 years, all the major issues are being brought to the court to make a decision. Now the court 
tries not to be imperialistic, tries not to be involved whenever it's not really needed. But eventually, you, somebody must be the adult in the scene. So the court in the last 25 years is in the kitchen. And where you are in the kitchen, you have stains. So many people are not happy with the decision of the last generation by the court. And whenever the court is involved, you have somebody who has, ah, I'll wait for you. Now you didn't give me what I really need, I'll wait for you. And it takes time and time and time. Nobody is naive here. We know that the prime minister today has an open discussion with the court about his future. So for many, many years, Prime Minister Netanyahu was actually the one who protected the court against all this. And he's on record so many times talking beautifully about the importance in liberal democracy to have independent and strong court. And I do agree. Now the story is, uh, I guess, different. And I let you, David, and your listening to decide if this is, if there is a connection between the two. Yeah, that's the way it appears. People noted, for example, that this court is not exactly the Aaron Barak court, that when people think of like a liberal activist, Aaron Barak from the 90s, who kind of, with the Knesset, by the way, it wasn't alone, it wasn't one guy, but created this kind of constitutional revolution of a kind of a bill of rights and, and the judicial review that the courts could override Knesset decisions. People said, if you actually look at the court composition of 2023, you will see that of the 10 judges that disqualified Arie Derry, who was this cabinet minister, the court said can't serve because he's got three convictions, half of the 10, five, were appointed during the Netanyahu period. So to caricature this court as a liberal court is not factually accurate. Do you agree? 100%, even more so. The whole idea of politicization of the court is archaic, is not relevant anymore. They used to say it in the past because they saw the, the court as more liberal than Israeli society. And this was a case years ago. Nowadays, it's not true anymore. If the system will be kept the same way, the chief justice of Israeli Supreme Court in, I think, two or three years will be a settler from a place called Ofrat. He is a, he's a religious guy. By all means, he seems to be right-winger and conservative in Israeli terms. And he will be the chief justice. If it is not broken, why fix it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let me, all right, so my last question is really this issue of the president of Israel, Bougie or Isaac Herzog. I remember his father was also president, so he's sometimes nicknamed Herzog II, but so there's a lot of talk, of, uh, and Yair Lapid mentioned this, a presidential commission, whether it's called a, permis- a commission or not a commission, somehow the president would oversee some of these changes that would get widespread support. And I don't want to embarrass you personally that I hear your name floated as someone the president consults with, So, but we'll leave that aside. But I'm curious whether you think it's going to go into this direction of the president trying to do some of these broad-based changes. Everyone thinks there should be some adjustments, but that's not the same as a wholesale overhaul that Yariv Levine has in mind. So A, is it a good idea? And B, is it likely? How do you see, where's this issue going? Yeah, for me, this is the most important question you're asking right now. It's not the details. It's our future as one nation solidarity between brothers in Israel is at stake. You know, we had in our past tragic events, including in 48, when they shoot Altalena ship and the murder of uh, assassination of Itzhak Rabin and the disengagement. And we are facing an event that might be of the same kind, unfortunately. I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared. So what we really need is not only legal scholars telling us what exactly to do, but we must have now a dialogue. And here I have some news for you, David, and for your listeners. I just did a survey, came out today, nobody knows it yet, in Israeli public. 54% are saying it's not legitimate to go ahead with any kind of solution without a dialogue. 
third of Israelis who voted for the current coalition say don't pursue it without a dialogue. It's a lot. So we have now a huge difference between what Israelis want and what politicians on the right and on the left are willing to do right now. The left and the right. We need a dialogue. And I think President Herzog is one great platform to host this kind of dialogue. I'm now the president of JPPI, and we're about to embark this coming Sunday on a national uh, campaign calling for dialogue, hoping to translate the majority in society into practical political action. It must be done before it will be too late. Well, you really helped enlighten us, Yadidia, because uh, in this subject, often in Israel, and not just in Israel, but involving politicians, is often more heat than light. So anything that could bring more light, uh, I think, is, is going to be welcome. And uh, you've enlightened us today. And I, I want to thank you very much for joining us today on Decision Points. Thank you, David. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. After talking to one of the top scholars of Israel's judiciary, I'd like to now talk to someone who recently retired from the Israeli Supreme Court bench. Justice El Yakim Rubenstein, it's a true honor to have you on our podcast, Decision Points. Your life has really spanned the life of Israel in many ways. You've done so much as a diplomat overseas in Israel, working as a cabinet secretary. You work with the famed Moshe Dayan as his personal advisor. You were at Camp David with Dayan in 1978. You were also at the Madrid Peace Conference of 1991, the chief negotiator with Israelis that had with both the Jordanians and the Palestinians. Also, you were negotiating Syria and Lebanon, chief negotiator with Jordan with the Peace Treaty of 1994, Attorney General of the State of Israel, and then crowning achievement on the Supreme Court of Israel and rose to be the Deputy Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And so I guess the question is, is what, having done so much in so many different areas for the State of Israel, you know, to try to understand what the court meant to you and where you felt was your unique contribution. You're also I don't mean to make you blush, but you're, you're a scholar and also in Jewish law, not just the Israeli Jewish prudence, but in the Mishpat Ivri, the whole Hebrew law, a real, what they call in Hebrew, a Talmud Chacham, a, a scholar of Talmud. What did it mean to you to be, be on the court? Where did you feel was your contribution? You know, what are you most proud of? Well, first of all, I, many years earlier, in 1980, I published the first book on the history of the Supreme Court of Israel. And, and on its inception in 1948, on the mandatory period law and how it developed in the state of Israel, and the appointments, including the history of the current method of appointment for now, people want to change. So I already had kind of a sense of the court in a way by this uh, book in 1980. And then I was for a while also, before I became attorney general, a district court judge in Jerusalem. Probably people would say, and I wouldn't question it, that I had the sense of being on the court as something which I would like to reach, if God helps. And indeed it happened. And I was there over 13 years. And it was, I don't want to say the most interesting part of my professional life, because if you take the army years together, I was about 50 years in the Israeli public service, which is a lot, you know. But the real thing on the court is not only the big things that now are being discussed, you know, basic laws and so on. It's important. But many a time, the assisting human being, a, uh, somebody needy or a group of people who are needy, that uh, would make you much more as satisfied as in big cases that the court is dealing with and they have the public eye and the publicity. So, 
you mentioned Jewish law, Hebrew law. I was really with a sense of mission. I wasn't the only one, of course. There were people who were much more knowledgeable than me in the former generation. I tried to instill that, to be inspired by that as much as I could. And I know that uh, there are now justices who do the same. So I'm very, on that, I was very happy. So let's go to the current situation. And really, I think for our listeners in America and around the world, we have a lot of listeners outside the United States and some in Israel too, the issue of understanding some of the approaches of the court. Why is it important, for example, that the judges are selected the way they are now? If you could explain uh, briefly how they're selected now and why it's important to maintain that. We have a, an original Israeli system carved back in 1953 that is now exactly 70 years, which is a combination of four entities. Two ministers headed by the Minister of Justice, who may be a politician or a lawyer or both. So two ministers, two Knesset members. Historically, they, they used to have one from the coalition, one from the opposition, but it uh, somehow dissipated mostly. And then two bar association representatives and three justices of the Supreme Court. That's the sitting chief justice and two other rotators. I was a member of the committee for three years. That's the selection committee. Officially, it's by the president, the ceremony of it. But the decision is in that committee and it combines and you have to get to agreements. So, of course, in, in the Supreme Court, you need seven of the nine people to select a justice. On lesser court, you need five, but mostly it is not uh, with a vote, it is by agreement. And of course, talks and conversations beforehand. Uh, I stayed also in a minority, but the that's the exception. Uh, the, the way it goes is that uh, now this system has been praised by many countries because it is a combination of the political forces and the professional forces. It has, and the, uh, as Yitzhak Rabin, Allah Shalom, used to say, the test of the result. And the test of the result is a very, a very fine judiciary, I don't speak of myself, God forbid, but a fine judiciary over those 70 years, the exceptions were of, of something wrong with a, a selection of a just judge were very, in the lower courts, were very few. So the quality is there, the experience is there. And now the idea is, which is for me a real, I'd say almost a tragedy if it happens, is to that's the suggestion now to uh, shift it to a political majority. They want to, to raise the number from nine to 11, three of which will be justices, but the, the rest will be political people. You want a good judiciary, a professional, and you need for whatever, of course, public reasons that the politicians are there. But the, if you want to make it into a process dominated by them, this means the politicization of the judiciary. Some people say, okay, but look at the U.S. and the states. They even elect them in the ballots. And in the federal system, it's the president. So it's almost always from the president's party. So, And what's wrong? You have the American judiciary. I say two things on that. One is not everything you can learn from the United States with all respect. This country has a tradition, it's fine, but I never understood how, for instance, you could elect judges in a ballot. If he or she wants to be re-elected, what does it do to their professional work? And uh, But uh, that's a tradition, okay, so why have this in our country too? The second thing is the nature of politics here is different. You have a full-fledged constitution. You have, uh, unlike our situation where we still don't have a full-fledged constitution, we have basic laws, which in my view are treated not 
not so nicely. They are being amended all the time, all the time. In, in this country, if you want to amend a constitutional article, you have to have a majority of the states, a majority of the, of Congress, long, uh, arduous process. So it's a different this system. So I think bottom line, our system currently is fine. And why changing? Moreover, now speak also of hearings in, in the, in the Knesset. Hearings here became very, well, it's nice for the media, but it became very uh, futile because a smart justice or judge or a candidate would say a controversial thing. Look, this could come to the courts. I don't want to express my view. They all remember the bulk situation back in 87. So in Israel too, it will become a media event, but no uh, real contribution to a better system. In particular, when you pick judges who never dealt with public issues, what are you going to ask them? So it's a uh, different system than this country. And I believe it is very good. It has been praised by many countries. No, absolutely. I mean, what you point out, if you want the American model, take the whole model. I mean, the model is a full constitution, an amendment process where you need three quarters of the states, not 61 votes, to change it, two houses of the Congress. You have a term limit of a president, two terms. It's totally different than Israel. And the protections in the United States are much greater I wish we had a full-fledged constitution. In fact, I'm very much for completing the constitutional process. It has political reasons why it doesn't happen. And you said, pick, don't pick. I remember when I negotiated with the U.S. secretaries of state after Kim David, they took parts of Kim David in, in order to satisfy our positions. So I would say, look, Kim David is not a fruit salad that you pick a cherry and a piece of apple and a, it's a package. And our package is different than the U.S. package. Uh, each has its own virtues and its own uh, shortcomings. Well, also, another clause that's being discussed is the whole override, the idea that the Knesset can override a court decision. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you were actually on the court, for all the talk of the courts in Israel are activists, they've only really overturned 22 laws in over 30 years, beginning with the Mizrahi decision of 1995. Miriam, my wife, argued for the government that case in, in 1994, and it was finalized in 95. yes. First of all, is sometimes the court in, in Israel, the Supreme Court, caricatured inside Israel. Oh, it's the Barak court. I mean, my understanding is of the 10 justices that voted, let's say Arya Derry, the minister needed to vacate his position because of three convictions, five of the 10 were actually named during the Netanyahu period. The court is not such an activist court the way it's sometimes being depicted. I just wanted your thoughts on that. And if there is an override, do you think the principle isn't terrible, but it, it should be closer to 70, 80 members? So then you've got a wide consensus in Israel. Well, first of all, it's not needed. You mentioned that there were about 22 cases of changing or canceling a, a law out of, this is about, there were between 450 and 500 petitions against uh, constitutional petitions, just 22 were accepted. So it's a 5%, something very, very meager. B, it doesn't exist in most countries of the world. That is, it exists in Canada, but as far as I know, the federal court there, it was uh, introduced, I, I believe, because of Quebec and all of that. So uh, the, the federal court never used it. But Erwin Kopler, the justice minister who someone both of us know, asked about that very point in Canada, and he said that uh, it's never been used on a federal level. So that's that's a good answer. And I'm told there's something in Finland, maybe in one more country, Finland, you need five, six of the parliament, but it's not needed. I repeat, it's not needed. But if they, they're so uh, keen on doing something which is not needed, then you need really a, a large majority, the, the numbers you mentioned, 
so as to make sure there's a consensus. And I would like to underline something. The court decisions on constitutional cases and cases in general are explained in long decisions. And the what you see in the political system many a time, with all respect, without uh, insulting anybody, that, that, there's a headline, and that's what catches the eye, and now we're going to be mad, and so on. So the notion of override should be serious. That is, having your advisors read, see what were the reasons the, the court decided to interfere in those cases that it did, and so on. And one should remember, most of the work of the, you know, the Israeli Supreme Court does two things. It does appeals, criminal, civil, administrative, and it does what's known as bagats, bagats, high court of justice, that you can petition to the Supreme Court right away without going through the echelon of courts on government decisions or administrative acts of the government and on constitutional matters. And this is a, by and large, a success story. It's like, in a way, the biblical city gate or the Athenian public square, and that you can go with your... And some, of course, are cases which are by nudnik, that's life, but... Many, many cases were a help for uh, those people who were in need. And I can give many examples. I'll give you just one example that comes to mind now. There's a small sect in Israel known as the Karaite Jews, a Yehudim Akaraim. This is a very ancient story. It goes back to the uh, first millennium. And they don't have a, a law that covers their needs. And they had bureaucratic problems for the slaughtering, which is a bit different than the regular rabbinical slaughtering, and for their divorce and so on. And they came to the court. I happened to, to chair the panel in both cases. And we fixed it by using the, this test of, uh, of, of something which is extremely unreasonable if you don't do something for them. So we did something for them, and they got their the response, which they couldn't get from the bureaucracy without being uh, too critical on the bureaucracy, but it happens. Sometimes the bureaucracy and the ministers wish that the court would do something or interfere. So that's where I stand. Now, now let's get a little more philosophical. Is The idea of democracy, of course, elections are at the center, but a democracy is not just majoritarian. A, a, a democracy is, we talked about the protection of individual rights, the rights of the minority. You brought uh, some of these touching stories about how you're going to help different people. This isn't about just the majority's will. So how do you, do you feel in Israel there's enough understanding of what what a democracy is? I mean, I have a feeling that if Menachem Begin was alive today, he was someone who was a lawyer. He was he went to the law school in Warsaw. He was in the opposition for decades. He understood that there could be a crushing tyranny of the majority. And he was very always the person who spoke out for the courts. He had a phrase that our American listeners might not know called Yesh Shoftim Yerushalayim. There's judges in Jerusalem, and there's a, a deference to those judges. So I'm just wondering if we're missing today Menachem Begin's voice that the Likud people, many who were talking about this, now, if Begin was the prime minister, it would be a very different tone by dint of his own experience that he was a, a liberal Democrat, and maybe in a 19th century sense of that word. But do we miss that voice in terms of defining the fuller meaning of what a democracy is? We are a democracy and and I think that begging and others of course contributed to the uh, democratic values you mentioned his attitude to the judicial system it's very accurate what you said he said it on a case which the government lost which he would have loved to have a different result but he said yes of team there are judges in Jerusalem that's the uh, and he called it the what we know as the rule of law he called it in Hebrew, Shiltona Mishpat, the judiciary is interpreting the law. I do think that 
we lack something of that. Although, of course, there are voices who now speak up and uh, against whatever is coming up. And I don't want to say that the judicial system or the attorney general system, which they also want to change, the legal advising in the government ministry is perfect. Nothing is perfect where there's a human element, there are mistakes, but by and large, it has been a tremendous contribution to the state of Israel. And if you want to weaken it, which is what is being talked about, it would be a pity. I'm proud of having served the country all these years. And uh, my late mother used to say, she encouraged me to join the government service by saying, the state has not finished to be built. And it's true now, too, of course. I think the Attorney General these days wrote, the, uh, Mrs. Gali Behaviara, wrote an opinion which spoke about the need to remember that the majoritarian element is one element, but it's not the whole thing. And I, I think it should penetrate the minds of the decision makers because we do have a democracy and we don't want it to be the dictatorial democracy that is that the government is in charge also uh, of the parliament, of appointing judges. It's, it doesn't look good. I don't know if I'm optimistic, but I believe there are many people in Israel, not only those who demonstrate now, but many others who, who believe that uh, we should maybe do some things. In my view, there are two things that could be done better the situation. One is a basic law legislation, because there's no rule on how to amend basic laws. They, they only in very few cases, the law uh, stipulates. And you want this to be orderly. That's one thing. And that is something which uh, I think there could be an agreement on. And uh, th then they'll fight on the number of how many they want this uh, unnecessary of ruling, but override, but it's doable. The other thing is, if you ask me, is augmenting the judicial system with judges and with uh, administrative help. You know, we have only 800 judges in Israel, and these 800 judges have to deal with, if you take 2022, I just heard it from the judge who administers the court. 850,000 new cases were opened in 2022. 850,000 and 800 judges. And then, of course, if, they, if you want to say that to cancel or to abolish a Knesset law, you need a special majority, and that's all doable. The main thing is not to weaken the judiciary, not to weaken it, it's also a newcome from America now, the international standing of the country. The court is a strategic asset of the state of Israel. And let's say the Hague court, the criminal court, it is uh, from time to time they say they are after us or somebody is after us or whatever. What is our uh, response? Response is you do complementarity. That is, if the country that is involved does not enforce the law and does not have a real judicial system, then we, Hague, the Hague come in. That's not the case with Israel. We have a strong judiciary. So why weaken it? It would be fair to say if these reforms go through, it would, it would end the independence of the judiciary. And I, something that you've devoted part of your life to, you know, how, this, I mean, countries that don't have an independent judiciary, you think of Hungary, Poland, Turkey, I mean, Israel that prides itself on always such a vibrant, vibrant democracy, even sometimes very raucous, but vibrant. And how how worried are you? You or Aaron Barak were quoted, it would be a hollowing out of the democracy with one branch in charge, the executive. The answer is that uh, we don't want to be Hungary. And I don't want to insult Hungary. I'm sure we have whatever relations, good relations with them. But the idea of weakening the judicial system is really not good for the standing of Israel abroad, besides its effects domestically. I don't think it's going to 
kill the independence, but it's going to weaken it to to great extent. And I'm hopeful that what what I'm now abroad, but and I really don't want to be over critical abroad. But I I believe that if the efforts of mediating somehow. Like uh, I'm, I'm told, President Herzog is is working on that, and other people. And if they they come to a, a result which is helping the the judicial system and not weakening it, that should be satisfactory to every citizen in Israel. I mentioned the many cases that are pending in the courts. You know, the, the person on the street is not, in my view, interested in big issues like basic laws and so on. What they are interested in is that if they file a a case in the court, an action, a complaint, it should be dealt with swiftly, not take years. And that is what I tried to say before, having more judges, having more administrative staff and so on. I'd like to be optimistic, although I speak with a sense of, of sadness, because uh, you want this country to flourish and to be a, a democracy and to to keep its values. And uh, the judiciary is a major part of it. And also the legal advisors to the government ministries, which are now also being, uh, they, they wanted to be a political appointee. I know it exists in the United States, but again, it's a totally different system. So one theme is this question of Herzog is through a presidential commission or the president bringing in experts to broker a compromise, you know, how optimistic are you that a solution could be found? Do you think that the coalition should stop its efforts like the attorney general said, like, and and Chayut, the chief justice said, like, give it a chance. But if you push through in the Knesset now, it's going to make it hard for this solution to be found? The answer is that, uh, indeed, I think that they should take the time. And I don't think anybody should drag their feet or something of the kind. They take the time and see what can be done, which is the criticism on this or that point. Look it up and see, but don't weaken the system. I have to say, frankly, there's been kind of a brainwashing of of groups in the Israeli society against the court. I think that, uh, again, the court is not perfect and it's only humane, but it's a good institution. And uh, if they do take the time, the way you mentioned, and the way the attorney general suggested, could uh, only be positive. What's the rush? And again, when I say what's the rush, it's not that I suggest to to drag it over for years or whatever, but give it a reasonable, real chance to be negotiated or discussed. Freeze it until this compromise has a chance to know if it's going to work or not. Then you can always deal with legislation later. Well, uh, that's the answer, yes. And with the goodwill of everybody, that is not do it just to put a V that you had a, a meeting, but uh, seriously working. And I think the Attorney General's suggestions are valid, and I hope they are listened to. And the same with Chayut. She gave a speech about this, too. I served for many years with her. Together, we were appointed the same day to the call in 2004. I think that she was uh, expressing from the heart what is at stake. And she should be listened to. And again, the Knesset is a very important part of our society. It's, it's elected and so on. But listening and talking and seeing what's going on in, an, in a serious way is an obligation of everybody. Okay, my last question is a philosophical question, which is Israel is known as, in America, you could say, too, a divided society in many ways. But look, I look at the issue of the ultra-Orthodox draft, and I know, I think in your last opinion that you wrote on this, I think you started with, like, the word yeush, like, uh, you know, I'm despairing from the fact that this issue goes round and round and round and round, and we want the government to send it, and then the government doesn't solve it, and then it comes back, and then it goes back, and then it goes back. Given your lifetime of knowledge about the legal system and your understanding of the different segments of Israeli society, 
Are there limits to what the court can adjudicate in such a divided country? You yourself are a religious person, and yet you've always been what they call in Hebrew, super mamachti. You know, you have always elevated the role of the state and tried to balance it with individual rights. How do you deal with individual rights when you have these groups that have their own ethos? Well, uh, first of all, I define myself as a uh, liberal religious Zionist. So that means that I'm a Zionist. I want the state of Israel to flourish. I think it's a major achievement of after 2,000 years of exile and after the Holocaust. And I come from a family that both lost a large number of, of relatives, including my grandparents and aunts and uncles in the Holocaust. If I compare Israel to my childhood years, it's a sea difference. I mean, the society is divided, but I do believe, I hope I'm not too naive, that when you come to the level of people, rather than the political clashes, the situation is better. I, for instance, I'm for dialoguing with all and if if you see my my whatsapp for the last few days you will see arab you will see haredi i keep those relations personally i believe i chair the government council on racism uh, trying to dialogue with everybody and the, I, I think the individual rights of Arabs are there and, and the haredi question of the draft and so on it is a divided society but there's no question that it's the whole picture, in my view, is a positive picture of a country that rose from the ashes and had to fight years and years with neighbors and is strong and economically strong. And I think we shouldn't forget that even when we talk about things that we don't like the subject that you asked me about and I try to respond. Well, Justice Yakim Rubenstein, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. And really, you know, I want to thank you for illuminating the whole idea of the Israeli judicial system. Somehow this issue that might have been seen as technical at one point now has been right at the heart of the, uh, of the front page, not just in Israel, but around the world. And a lot of democracies are trying to grapple with the right balances. And I just want to thank you so much for your time and joining us on Decision Points today. Thank you very much. In conducting the interviews with both Professor Stern and Justice Rubenstein, it is important to realize that these are two of the most mild-mannered, very prominent experts of the Israeli judicial system that one is likely to meet. Neither of them are fire-breathing radicals, but both are people of very reasoned judgment and temperament. And both of them are deeply concerned about how the legislative package impacts the future identity of Israel, and both are convinced it would undermine the independence of the courts by politicizing them. In fact, Rubenstein, Deputy Chief Justice until his retirement, recently participated in two of the demonstrations in Jerusalem against the current package. If one listens carefully to Stern and Rubenstein, one senses there's common ground for compromise if Israeli President Herzog can help spearhead the effort. Neither of them believe the Israeli Supreme Court is perfect, yet each of them fears for the future of the court, and each of them wants to preserve the character of Israeli democracy, including its protection of minority rights. Each of them favors a broad-based approach that could yield constructive change without throwing out the metaphorical baby with the bathwater. Yet a compromise takes time. Both of them believe that Israeli Justice Minister Yariv Levin should provide that time and not press for a blitz legislation without a prerequisite of a national debate. So is a collision coming to a head between the advocates of the government's package and its opponents unless a compromise for broad-based change is given a chance under the auspices of President Herzog, the only thing that seems certain is that the political temperature that has been rising in Israel will get closer and closer to a boiling point. I want to thank you all for listening. 
to this bonus episode of Decision Points. I want to thank all of our listeners from all over the world. I hope you listened to all of season four and to all previous seasons. You can find Decision Points on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast, as well as on the Washington Institute website. Download and subscribe to never miss an episode. While you're there, please leave us a review and rating and tell your friends. I want to thank all those who made this podcast possible. Our coordinators, Gabriel Epstein, David Papkin, and Jonah Schrock, and our researchers, Valeria De La Fuente and Stuart Harris. I also want to thank Jeff Rubin, Scott Rogers, Carolina Krauskopf, and Maria Radacci of the Washington Institute. And finally, Adrian Bain, our producer, and Richard Myron from Earshot Strategies. Thank you all.